So I would say your psychological thrillers are your serial killer thrillers because mm. the, the amount of, uh, of the, the research that most of your writers have done in order to be able to produce the, um, you know, or, or have the, the, the police follow uh, and try and work out the, the, who the murderer is or the serial killer is, they, they've all researched it, say, so, well, it's there, it's, it's too enticing to avoid. In Britain, it's, you know, if we all started writing, I mean, I know Val wrote um, Mermaid Singing, um, but if we were all into writing, <laughs> <True>. <laughs> I think the whole of Britain would go into kind of shock because every library shelf would be chock-a-block of... And people would really, I think, be quite appalled, thinking, are there really this many serial murderers in Britain? So we've opted to go down a different route with the psychological thriller, which I think is to... is, is, a, is a much quieter voice, not nearly so frenetic as the serial killer thriller voice because that has to have a series of murders in it mm -hmm. which of course keeps the pace a going. sensationalism yeah, and absolutely. upping it as we yeah, go yes exactly go, exactly we've gone the other way we've kind of gone right inside it's, so it tends to be much darker i think that because we take a handful of people maybe just one murder probably just one murder but you know we are saying in order for the murders like this to happen any murder really there has to be some dark happenings going on. I mean, if you take mine, uh, usually there's 10 years of, of sort of previous happenings uh, which come into the story because I simply don't believe, especially as the way I write, which is either based on a family or a small community, uh, there is no way you're just going to suddenly get a murder coming out of nowhere. There has to be a history. Behind it, yeah, yeah, and uh, so that's our, the way we've tended to do it. We've kind of gone inside mm -hmm. the people, but we're both writing psycho. I mean, America and England, we're both doing the psychological thrillers, but the American is much faster, much pacier, uh, and has gone. I would, I, I would have said down that route, down the serial killer route, and. Believe me, if we had more serial killers in England, I'd, I'd be quite tempted myself because I think it's fascinating. The whole science uh, is fascinating. It is fascinating. Yeah. And also, I think, to be fair, that there's a, a much more filmable element. And if part of oh, yeah. the reason that people are writing novels today, those people who wish to make a living writing novels today, is the interest in perhaps selling it on to a more lucrative medium than publishing, than something that can translate to film. Uh, which necessarily has to be more action and more outward, more yeah. external than yeah. something that's a deep yeah. internal exploration. Mm. It's very hard to make a film mm. out of something that's so interior. may have something to do with why there's a lot of that going on yes. in the States where the film market is yes. so large. Yes. Mind you, you know, we, we live in optimism. I think the British are make, <laughs> making a comeback mm. slowly. Um, interestingly, the, the dark room, um, um, whether it'll happen, it's always one of those things, but you know, we're trying to get a British movie Are up you? and running for that. Well, because, you know, it's, 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 it's set in a, really in one room, if mm -hmm. you think about it. Uh, certainly the, the setting for it is, is um, it's not a huge tapestry. And uh, I, th well, I mean, uh, we've, we've got a producer and director who are really interested, but it's all a question of whether we can get financing for it. Um, but. The, so in a sense, you know, it works both ways. Um, yes, a big action pace thriller, um, fine, will turn very well or translate very well into a fast action paced um, film. But, you know, the other way to look at it, if you think that the Ice House, for example, the BBC have just made the Ice House, and that is incredible, the power, because they've made it very gothic. It's dark, they're in, the women work brilliantly and they've got over the the whole relationship between the three of them and the characters who come in and break their isolation but because of the way they filmed it it's very kind of film noir but in color <laughs> and uh, but it's it's wonderful they've got this wonderful heavy atmosphere working in it and i think you know if we can get the dark room up and running it would be the same but in a very confined space which will make it claustrophobic, which is, after all, what the book is. Very so, true. You know.
Well, of course, we can wander off into a debate between British and American yeah. filmmaking, which I think has <laughs> significant differences. Yeah. There. But I'm, I'm very much looking forward to seeing the first two books as films uh, because I've so enjoyed them as books. And oftentimes that, again, is an unnerving thing for a reader to have loved a book and then see a film, which is, after all, a different experience and wonder, uh, will one be disappointed? Will it simply have a life of its own? Um, will one like it better? You know, yeah. there are all these all these possibilities. I think, which well, are fascinating. Well, I certainly when I I very deliberately watched them both as television, not mm -hmm. as right. by book translated to pictures. I just sat down and watched them, and I said to myself, "Is this good television?" And I think both of them make excellent television. Very exciting. Mm. And that it probably is the only sane way mm. to do it. I've always mm. thought that the man who could be king or the name of the rose, the man who would be king or the name of the rose, were marvelous films, mm. as distinguished from marvelous books. Yeah. And they were actually wonderful both ways. Yeah. But yeah. each had, um, because of the medium, again, I think each had a very special um, life of its own mm. and a magic mm. that you had to buy mm. into. Well, there were a couple of things that uh, were identified specifically as ambiguities in mm. your books. So now that we've talked a bit about the background, let me toss a couple of them at you. One was ambiguity in sexual orientation. Yeah. Now, is that something that, that you agree with, disagree with? Uh, do you find that, that is, can one pinpoint, say, the three women in the ice house? What is their sexual orientation? Does it matter that we know? Is it is part of the mystery, in fact, wondering? Well, I feel like saying yes to all those questions. You see, I think what it, what it, yes, it, in a sense, it's completely irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Um, where, if they are lesbian, if they're not lesbian, it really is um, completely immaterial to what they themselves are, which is women who uh, are completely tolerant. All three of them, they have a, a tolerance level that is probably above, well, certainly above the village n where they live. True. Because those people are totally intolerant. Um, to them, it doesn't matter what people think about them. Um, they, and that that's really what the the importance of the book because the it's that book is all about prejudice it's all about how um, prejudice can destroy people's lives and you know I mean I would I would simply say it's up to the reader really to make what they can out of the what those women say and how they behave as to what the reader believes about them and I think it would be it would be different to different people. And if the sexual orientation of these women can be debated, what about um, their character? Are they agents of justice? Are they accomplices to murder? What is their what is their actual role in the book? Um, don't you think they're both? Again, I don't know. This was yeah. her question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm finessing um, the answer yeah. by asking you. <laughs> Uh, yes, well, I think I'm, I'm agreeing with her that there, that there is a lot of ambiguity. Um, in the, in the first, look, I think the way I would say it is, is this way, is that up until the discovery of the body in the ice house, they are, um, they're sort of in a vacuum. They don't, justice is not important. Um, and neither is revenge. N in a sense, nothing is important. They are merely existing. And then suddenly, their isolation, which they have learned to tolerate. Right. Um, they don't necessarily enjoy it, but they, they have grown used to it. Um, and they can live with it. Suddenly, bang, it's all split apart. And they go back to the sort of um, terror that at least one of them experienced before, um, where nothing any longer is certain. What they thought they had grown used to and what they thought would be their lot forever, they suddenly see that that's not going to. Nothing can be the same again. Um, and I think at that point, I think they do then maybe take on a, a different role. And I think each one takes on, each one is separate. I don't think they, as a, as a group, they all act in the same way. Um, I think Phoebe always remains um, 
unsure, really. I don't think Phoebe at any point is terribly certain about anything.